Darwin suspects that the tale is all about sex. He thinks that the more spectacular the tale, the larger it is with more eye spots, the more attractive the peacock is to the peahens. But how to prove it? Marion has been following up Darwin's idea to see whether a large tail is really important in seducing females. What's that happening? Doesn't disturb them too much. Okay. But um, but what we've got here are several males displaying. It's basically like great big advertising banners for the male. Yeah, exactly. To say here I am. Yeah. Look what look how many eye spots I've got on my tail. Aren't I great? Yeah. If they're communicating yeah. to to the female, and they're basically saying. Hopefully, I'm better than the next guy. Uh, pick me, pick me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a hoot dash there. Did you see that? Yes. Yeah. So if the hen had actually stopped and squatted in front of the male at that point, he would have actually um, uh, mounted her, and then you would have got copulation. So that's a yeah. Is that the end of the courtship display? Then, exactly. That? Okay. That's the last last phase. And that's called a hoot dash. A hoot dash. Yeah. So he just he, he hoots and then drops his tail slightly and runs after. Yeah. There's a nice noise as well, sort of like ow. Yeah. yeah. Just like a disco on a Saturday night. According to Darwin, a male with a bigger tail and more eye spots would have more sex and therefore more offspring. To test Darwin's theory, we're going to trim the tail of a peacock and see if he can still score with the ladies. But first, we have to catch one. Okay, so what's the procedure? Big net. Big net like this, yeah. Bring the net over from the behind the bird, if you can, over top of the head. Yeah. Get the whole body of the bird in the, in the net, and then you quickly work your way up to the, up the handle and... Grab his feet. Grab both feet. Have I shown you my scars? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Where are your scars? That's where they usually get you. That's a peacock, that's that's a peacock scar across really there. One up there. So on my hand, yeah, right there. And yeah. they, they kick up then, do they? Well... As I said, you must, you must be firm with them once you've got hold of them. You've got to keep hold of those two legs at all costs. Come on, come round here. Go, go. That's it, well done. Both legs. Hold it, if you hold the back. It's like Rod Harlan Emu. <laughs> Darwin hopes that an experiment like this would explain why the tail of the peacock could have evolved. But he never actually carries it out. He can never persuade anyone to help him. As he puts it, who would sacrifice the beauty of their bird for a whole season to please a mere naturalist? Well, Quentin has agreed to cooperate. So we're going to do something Darwin never did. We'll cut 20 eye spots off this tail. That's number one. Number one. Although it's completely painless, Marion thinks this reduction in the size of his tail will be a big blow to his sex life. The amazing colour isn't pigment. It's No, it's got it's, nothing to do with pigment. It's though. light reflected, isn't it? It's a crystal lattice arrangement that scatters the light in a particular way, um, which gives us these iridescent co the colours. He'll suddenly work something out when all the females are ignoring him because he had the best tail in the whole place. He's going to go from John Travolta to Steptoe. <laughs> Let's see how Steptoe gets on with the ladies. Has no idea, does he? No. <laughs> we've just changed his whole attractiveness. <laughs> Today, we've only tested a single bird. But Marion Petrie has studied hundreds of peacocks over 20 years. Her work proves that those peacocks with more eye spots consistently have more and healthier offspring than the less well-endowed males. The more spectacular the tail, the better the mate, and the more likely the female is to choose him. This is why the peacock has evolved such an ostentatious tail, even though it reduces his ability to fly. What's great about this, though, is to think that, you know, Darwin would have loved to have done this as well. You know, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, that's a great feeling. No, no, Darwin would have felt, you know, vindicated sitting here. You know? Yeah, I told you so. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Darwin becomes obsessed by the topic of sex and its role in the natural world. 
Sexual reproduction is key to evolution because it introduces variation in animals. Variations are important since they can improve the offspring's chance of success. They might be faster, stronger or a better fit to the environment. So Darwin argues that sex is necessary for natural selection to occur. But if this is the case, he has to explain plants. They don't seem to fit his theory at all. In Darwin's day, botanists believe that plants reproduce with themselves. Botanists think this because each flower contains both male and female sex organs. They assume that since the organs are so close together, it is easy for the pollen from the male part to fertilize the female part. This self-fertilization produces almost identical offspring. Darwin realized if this was true, it was a real problem for his theory. All the offspring of the plant would be very similar, certainly not different enough for evolution to happen. To save his theory, Darwin needs to show that plants have sex with different individual plants. Only in this way can plenty of variation be created. He sets out to prove the botanist wrong, and I'm going to the place where he starts. It's Down Bank, one of Darwin's favourite haunts, and with me is local nature expert Alistair Hayes. So Alistair, we're here at Down Bank, and, and Darwin loved this place. I mean, for him, it was as impressive as somewhere like the Galapagos, wasn't it? It was, and it was so close to his home. It's only two fields away from Down House. He'd been round the world, and he finds this place, and he thinks it's so inspirational. I mean, he brings his family here for picnics, but whilst they're eating, he does his work on this side. <laughs> <laughs> right, the flower for Darwin must have been a conundrum. He's thinking, right, I've got this whole theory, it, it all fits in place, but flowers cause him a problem. Cause him a problem, which he solved on this side. So he came out here, and he came out on days like this, and he looked at the insects flying around, he looked at the butterflies, he came out at night, and looked at the moths. Um, and really close examination of these species and he saw on their heads, on their tongues, were actually the pollen, the male parts from some of the flowers and they were actually flying off to another flower. So he started to think, well, hold on a minute, this is way the, the, the pollen gets moved from plant to plant and how they can reproduce between two parents. It's amazing. And so this very site was, was fundamental and underpinning Darwin's theory. It, 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 it was. A few earlier botanists had noticed that bees carry pollen from one flower to another, but they assumed that this is a rare and insignificant event. Darwin is now convinced that insects are full-time artificial inseminators for plants, and flowers have evolved every detail of their colour, scent and shape for one purpose only, to make sure insects will visit them and carry their pollen to other flowers. Incredible. Yes, to everyone except Darwin. But how can he demonstrate it? I'm at Kew Gardens to do another Darwin experiment. The subject is a tropical orchid, one of the most elaborate flowers in existence. The first challenge for me, as for Darwin, is to get hold of one. They're rare, fickle and only flower for one week a year. Here we have one of the largest collections of orchids in the world, and Kew is one of the, uh, it's probably the largest research institute for orchids here. Now, you're an expert on orchids, and Darwin was obsessed with orchids as well, wasn't he? Yes, Darwin was very, very passionate, and he actually said that of any subject, orchids were his main passion. What have we got here? Uh, this is one of uh, Darwin's favourite orchids. It's kind of the orchid that he was using for a lot of his uh, pollination studies. Uh, this is Catacetum from uh, South America. Okay and it's got a very elaborate uh, pollination mechanism which is what uh, Darwin was most interested in. Darwin uses a pencil to mimic the insect. As it enters the catacetum flower, it presses against the trigger. A delicate membrane breaks and releases a package of pollen. The sticky base of this package adheres to its back. If it's an insect, it flies away with the pollen in the perfect position to pollinate the next flower. 